Kia ora and welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod after a Rugby World Cup final where South Africa once again scaled the heights and made it to another title. The best team in Rugby World Cup history. Four titles, well done to South Africa. They did what they had to do. They won their playoff games by small margins and they chose to do what they always do, which is find a way to win. So congratulations to them. We will look into that, about how they won the game, where the game was won and lost. Of course, we'll have a look at some of those more controversial aspects. Plenty of emails coming in about those. And of course, the fan reaction in New Zealand, the fan reaction in the world in some cases is slightly different. So we'll try our best to be balanced and have a look at all of those things and what happened on the weekend with the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand not winning, South Africa doing it once again. World Rugby Awards. Adi Savia, we've been waiting for years for Adi Savia to be the World Player of the Year. So he gets a gong, a Rugby League player gets a gong as well, which is quite an incredible story about the state of the game. Although Tyler Nathan Wong did a wonderful job for the Sevens until she switched codes. And of course, Farrell got the coach of the year, not the Springboks coaches who went all the way to the title. Interesting. So plenty to talk about, including the WLXV. So stay tuned with us throughout this episode. Of course, next to me, James Parsons. Jippy, you've recovered. Yeah, yeah, recovered, recovered. Uh, tough, tough uh, morning, but I think you're right. I mean, the, this South African side is going to go down in history. You know, we look at the All Blacks that did 2011-2015. This team um, will go down as, as their heroes, as those players have done for our nation. So um, a, an exciting time for, for the country. You know how much rugby means to the South African public, so that'll be right. It really was, and you could see it. Um, and the text message I received out of South Africa, you know, the celebrations are huge and the meaning for them is they go through load shedding and, you know, the things that they go through in that country that we can't even imagine in New Zealand. Um, it's yep. been quite amazing. Well, I, I live um, on the North Shore, which has got a heavy South African population and, and going through uh, Browns Bay, you said it was <laughs> a lot. And I mean a lot of South African <laughs> flags. And uh, they certainly uh, this had started the celebrations well and truly early. Yeah, yeah. Ubering home, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Little South Africa, Browns Bay and the North Shore. Good place to go and uh, have a braai. That's what it smells like there bridges. on the weekend. So <laughs> joining us, of course, as well from Japan, Bryn Hall in the middle of his training camp. It's tough times over there, but you got up in the middle of the night, you watched that game. Bryn, have you recovered from that? No, I haven't. I haven't recovered mentally and I haven't recovered like physically with our camps that we're going through at the moment. So for all the Japanese viewers that do watch this, um, I'm getting a very good understanding of what these Japanese camps are like. So we're into our sixth day of our 14th day camp and um, it's been very, very, very challenging, but um, great to be able to keep with, connect with our, our company workers and our men. But um, yeah, got up at four o'clock, Ross, like the most of New Zealand did. And yeah, we'll touch on all the kind of um, conversations around that. But yeah, obviously the South African team, if you're talking around the gauntlet that they had to go through to get that World Cup win, um, you could arguably say they're the best team ever to go through a World Cup stage and what they had to go through to get that, that championship. So yeah, gutted as a Kiwi, but um, the bigger picture, uh, yeah, South Africa, well-deserved in, in winning that World Cup. To you, above all other things, as a person who's been talking about discipline and goal kicking for weeks, and that being the winning and the losing of the game, it's quite clear that you were right. Yeah, I, I, we knew that points were going to be crucial as you got to the latter stage of this Rugby World Cup. And, and you, I mean, I've pushed Pollard pretty heavily uh, when Leboc was in there, that he needed to be in there purely because he can kick goals and, and win you tournaments. And it proved, you know, every opportunity he got, he, he took. Um, I think the, the actual winning of it, though, was their defence. Like, the, the amount of ball the All Blacks had and only to score one try is actually quite amazing. Like, 62% possession, 62% territory. They forced uh, 19 turnovers, and I do put that down to that rush defence and putting skill set under pressure because the All Blacks created a lot of opportunities. We just couldn't get that last pass to get us, I, I suppose, legally across the line. Like obviously mm. got across the line with Aaron Smith, but that was that was called back. But they kept the Kiwis to 31% game line percentage. You know, that that's the lowest they'd had of the tournament. So all these sort of effort areas, like, and I think it was led by uh, Peter Steph de Toit, but I thought uh, Dion Fleury as well, um, he was the second top tackler. And I, almost I think he was the performance because he was put in so early in such a crucial position that he hasn't had a lot of experience in international rugby and he just played a blinder, I felt. Well, around the field he was good. He did, his line-outs were wobbly. But the thing yeah, is, but they, they were Cody Taylors. They took um, easy options for him, though, which was yeah. as, as easy as possible. But they weren't looking to play, so yeah. winning the line-out ball at the back, it didn't really matter to them. It's yeah. like, let's just win it and kick it. 
Yeah. You know, because if if we had 62%, then you know, obviously they had 38%, and out of that 38%, they still kicked more times. So 36 kicks to our 35. So they pretty much just got the ball and kicked it. Mm. They didn't look. To, to, I suppose, get into their attacking rhythm, which we know they're capable of. But they came with a game plan, they executed, and they, they won. Interestingly, Bryn, out of every team that won during the playoffs, there wasn't a single winner who had dominated possession. Yeah, well, it just shows, I, I guess, you know, we talk around defence wins championships, and a lot of times, Jip has brought that up when they hit they, Super Rugby. Even the, the All Blacks boys talked around defence winning championships. And look, you look at the amount of, not just the defensive pressure they put on, but the contact areas that their forward packs were able to put on. Look, you look at that Peter Sifter toy on Jordy Barrett early on in that game, right in the transition area, and it's pretty much you're going mano y mano, and he just absolutely smokes Jordy. And Jordy obviously is tough in himself and was able to be able to get over the advantage line. But Peter Sifter toy and that forward pack were just able to win consistently, keep winning collisions. And to the credit of the All Blacks in that first half, I believe they did try to play a little bit. They tried to get to eight to nine phases, but through that good defensive pressure, along with the wet weather probably helped the South Africans to be able to put us under pressure. And then, you know, I think positively for us, we then tried to go to our kicking game. Look, we went to 35 kicks, just one less of South Africa. So we actually had that game management side of having the plan B to try and um, have that game management side of the building pressure off our kicks. 19 turnovers compared to the nine turnovers of the South Africans. And they also had seven turnovers defensively at the breakdown, who I thought in the last 20 minutes, Kwaha Smith coming on and having three turnovers was massive for them. So that 7-1 split that we talked about and everybody's talked about, I think it paid massive dividends in that back end of the game with the likes of Kwaha and that forward pack coming on to finish off the game. Yeah, it was risky though. Like, I'll tip my cap, that was a bold play because if there was an injury in the back, especially in the wet weather, it could have been <coughs> quite damaging. It didn't happen. I, did, I do think though there are other times we could potentially, if we looked at, um, you know, we kicked to the corner, which I like. That's our DNA, that's what we're about. But. You know, maybe could have we taken the points then and then Jordy Barrett's one wasn't as necessary and then gone to the corner just for, you know, how challenging that kick was. There's many things you can, oh, Captain Hindsight, you can you can go back and look at, but um, I do think the defence, and, and they didn't allow us to enter the 22 a hell of a lot. We only had 22 rucks of 120 in our 22. Other than that, between the 22s, 84. So we played a lot of rugby you know, not in that sort of, uh, I suppose, that, that kill zone or that war zone that teams like to call it when they get in there in their own 22 where you really want to execute and, and take your points. So, um, you know, that, that was a big part. And when you see the turnovers, 19-9, like obviously the All Blacks were always going to have more because they had more possession. But it was how they were forced and it was through brute, um, you know, physical yeah. dominance in the tackle or their line speed. Mm. I thought their midfield did a great job at, you know, really shutting down those outside channels to, you know, not allow guys like Will Jordan and Mike Talia to have a massive impact on the wide channels. I know they came in and got involved around the ruck, but not as much as we've seen previously. Jesse Creel is interesting because, you know, there's so much talk about Lucanio Arm, but really, Brenner, Jesse Creel through this World Cup <coughs> has been a man mountain for South Africa. Well, he's experienced as well, isn't he? You know, he's been around for a very long time. And, and a lot of those players, you have to think in that South African team, are, are very experienced at the previous World Cup and then coming into this 2023 World Cup. And, yeah, I think his connection is just spot on. I think, man, the, the defensive pressure that Jesse Crew and their outside backs putting pressure on our ball carriers, especially when our outside backs are trying to get it to the edge, um, was, pretty out, was pretty outstanding, I thought. And... I think the weather dictates that a lot. When it's wet, Jip, you know, it's been able to, you know, it's that split second more defensive, that the defensive effort is a lot easier to try and um, stop the attack. But yeah, the connections in and around the the, the outside backs, even with the loose forward edge with Peter Steph de Toyd and, and Sia Khaleesi when they're in those positions, they were all on the same page. And just the effort areas, effort areas, sorry, they were just, they were men possessed. They were just up, but in your face, up and uh, up again, and they just worked collectively as a unit for the whole. When they're on fifteen on fifteen, and then when the bench came on, they added the exact same impact around the effort areas, and you know won the World Cup that way. I have to say though, like we put ourselves in a position to win that World Cup. Mm. Like I don't, it, yep. it's not all dominance and um, you know a, a clear easy win. Um, you know it was hard fought for South Africa. They came in with a plan, they executed it, but um, you, you'd have to say all the th things Bryn just mentioned, but. You know, like it'll be one we probably feel that got away because we put ourselves in a position to win it, but our execution didn't allow us to take it. There was an element where you felt like they were going to come over the top, and then they didn't. 
And the statistics say that the All Blacks only scored three points across the quarter semi and final in the last 20 minutes. And yet how do you win a close game? How do you win a close final against a team like South Africa unless you can figure <coughs> out how to score points in the last quarter? Yes and no, because like if you use the Ireland game, like because we got off to such a hot start, it actually put the pressure on Ireland to chase, which then allowed us to defend and, you know, not mm. defend your lead, but, you know, I do think, you know, you look at the stats, 207 tackles to 82, you'd think the team that makes 82 would win. But time and time again, we've seen in rugby, the Crusaders have made <coughs> a business of it, so, tackling over 200 times and winning games. So sometimes you're better to not have the ball um, than have it. So I, I don't... Yeah, I don't read too much into that because we put ourselves in positions to take points in the last quarter. But with that being the case, and you need to score, it's pretty hard to score without the ball. You know what I mean? Like, there comes a time, especially if you're down in your own 22 and you've got three minutes to get to the other end, that you've got to figure out how to score. Yeah, but you've just got to get the balance right. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, like I said, like 84 rucks in between the 22s. And I do think we kicked really well, um, but maybe, yeah. you know, all those unforced, unforced errors sort of thing was us trying to play too much, you know? Mm. So it's, it's how you score, how you, I suppose, play the chess game to get to the position you want to score, mm. if that makes sense. <laughs> Probably not. You look at the South Africans, a bailout was a drop goal, mm. you know, eight to nine phases. Whether we, you know, we missed a, missed a shot in and around having a go at having a drop goal, because what it does do, it takes away that turnover element. You know, you're going in that no, no man's position, not really in your shape. They're winning the, the killers near. There's 40 men on your feet. I think the South Africans. It's a it's a very good ploy that I feel they do, and the Northern Hemisphere teams do that. If you go in nowhere in that half, you can reset, take a drop goal. If you get it, it's three points, beautiful. And it's almost demoralising trip, I believe, as a team as well. You've defended so hard for that eight to nine phases, and you you still walk away with three points as the opposition. So maybe there's an that's an area we could have gone in in that game, like Dan Carter did in 2015, just dropped back in the pocket and got a and got a drop goal. But you know. Like you said, Captain Hindsight's great, isn't it, Jip? Because you do get the ball back as well if it doesn't go over. Mm. Um, mm. You know, normally they'll have to clear their territory if it lands short or you get the 22. So, um, yeah. I still, yeah, I, I don't think we'd change our tactics because we gave ourselves the opportunity to win it. We just didn't get the three <coughs> points or we didn't get the conversion. So, um, mm. you know, like, and you talk about the effort areas of the, the Springboks. Well, that charge down of Adi Savia's, you know, like, we we delivered a lot on our effort areas as well. And, um, I think it's a game they can be really proud of. To go down, lose your captain, red card, and stay in the fight, um, and yeah. grit, determination, it's, it's, they can, I know that it's going to be hurting, like, it's hurting all of us, it's hurting the country, but, man, it was a pretty valiant effort mm. in, the, in the circumstances. Uh, Bryn, when I think about that, I, I didn't feel the hurt as much as I have in other finals, the 95 final, maybe losing in the semi-final in 2019, there was a feeling for the first time that to a degree, while they didn't win it, that was a success in where they've come from. Mm. In the same way that Michael Checker's team was a success in 2015 and that they'd come from nowhere and managed to make the final. You know, like there is an element of that in this that I think softened the blow, maybe for the fans more than the players, obviously. Yeah, I definitely think the players will be gutted. But yeah, I think you're right, Ross. I think the difference as well is that, you know, you look at those 95 and those and those finals that we have lost, we were, you know, we were massive favourites going into them, you know. So the disappointment was because, you know, we should have won those games. But you look at kind of the the resilience and where, we, where we've come from in the last two years um, to get that win over Ireland and then obviously be in a position to to try to beat South Africa and that red card happening. Yeah, it kind of, I felt the same way. I felt that, you know, like, now, we had our chance to win, like we've, like we've talked about, there were a few opportunities that we just missed, but you look, it's hard enough playing 15 against the South Africans with that forward split, let alone, you know, losing your skipper. And what that does game management-wise and around your lineouts, your, your face play strike without having your loose foot on the edge or in that middle, you know. So the solutions that our boys had to try and make and to keep it that close again and to be able to tr still be in a position to win a game, um, yeah, I was pretty proud, you know, after that game and thinking, man, that is one that's got away, but at the same time, to get in the position where it's 12-11 and the South Africans still just just beat us after that, um, yeah, I, was, I walked away pretty proud watching our boys and the growth that they've shown in their last, especially the last two years under Fozzie and that player management group and as well. I thought, and man, I thought Sam spoke so well afterwards, you know, like mm -hmm. that was a hard night um, for him personally, but the way he said, look, we've seen it, you know, and he copped on the chin, you know, like mm -hmm. there was no excuses. You know, Fozzie's obviously hasn't come out and looked for any excuses either, so... 
I think under pressure and in the biggest circumstances, there was there was great leadership shown. I thought Artie did a great job in, in managing the ref um, once Sam went off too. So I, th I think there were a lot of bright sparks um, in in challenging circumstances and things that you know your true character comes to the floor under pressure. And that 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 was a night that you know was immense pressure. And I, I thought. As a nation, we should be proud of the way we responded to that. Let's talk about that. Artie Sabe obviously has been named World Player of the Year, deservedly so. I think he could have been World Player of the Year any of the last five <laughs> years, really. Like, he's been that good for so long. Um, but Artie stepped into that position. Like, around him, there's, there are calls that uh, have been missed. There are calls that have been changed by TMOs. His job to relate to the referee hold the frustration when there's time wasting, there's players going down injured at the end, there's all of those things that are obviously upsetting him. Um, as a captain, how do you negotiate that and stay on side with the ref and maybe try to get things back in your favour when you can feel like the odds are almost against you? Yeah, well, I think a lot of it comes... The hard thing is he wasn't probably expecting to be in that position, mm. but... Um, you know, a lot of it does come before the game, um, as Bryn will know as well, is having those conversations of some trends that you've seen that you may feel will be frustrating, and they may use, and we, and we uh, you know, it's no surprise that those tactics were used, so they'd know that as well. Um, so there's that work, but then, it, like, I thought he got the balance, like, I was extremely frustrated at home. Mm. Like, I'm not going to lie, like, uh, the elephant in the room, there were some calls that I personally didn't agree with. And I, I was getting frustrated as a fan, like, but I think he asked the question, he got the answer and then said, OK, you know, like you can't over push, I don't believe, because then you just, it's just going to go from bad to worse because it's going to irritate the ref. So that's what I think. I just think he got the balance right of, he definitely asked the question, but he wasn't so um, antagonising, I suppose, to, to Wayne. And, and what I would say, very, very frustrating um, questions he was wanting wanting answers to. OK, let's go there then. What calls were you frustrated by? Well, I think probably the one the most like is probably the penalty that Adi Savia got, because there was a clear release and then, you know, I've always said it, and people will know this at home, that I, I can deal with inconsistencies week to week. What I can't deal with is inconsistencies within that 80 minutes, because it's just, it, it, that's irritatingly feels not fair. Um, so th that one was probably a big one. Um, and at the time, you never know that the big moments, but it's three points. Goes off the p post and in. Um, and then I, I suppose my understanding is, and I know it's not rules, but how far you can go back, um, obviously with Aaron Smith's try, but in saying that, the right call was made. Mm. And I think you made that to me. as like, oh, it's frustrating. You're like, yeah, but wh what's the, where's the balance? Like, do we want the right call? Um, and I, I struggled to answer that. Um, because I am obviously one of the All Blacks to win and wanting that try. So, um, and then and then I suppose just the I, I don't have really have that much of a problem with Wayne Barnes, but just how much the TMO got involved. Yeah, I just felt like it was unnecessary. Mm. Um, and and you know, like if I looked at Super, I think um, the TMO was sort of had to be asked rather than putting themselves on the referee. So. Um, it was it was really sort of owned by the one person, whereas it sort of felt like the TMO was roofing the game. Yeah, yeah. There's a, as part of the World Rugby guidelines, they refer to a team of four, TO4, which is a reference to the referee, the two assistant referees, and the TMO working as a pack. So there's definitely within the guidelines been a certain amount of responsibility put on, put on all of them to make calls together. So the idea that the referee is the sole judge has kind of been thrown out the window. And in some cases it works and in others it doesn't. Um, to refer to a couple of things you've spoken about, just to, to put it on the table. When we talk about that try to Aaron Smith and the fact that they went back four phases, there is actually a World Rugby TMO guideline that says, where match officials believe a clear and obvious infringement may have occurred in the immediate two phases of play, leading to a try being scored, or in the preventing of a possible try from being scored. So two phases of play is the guideline, but that's a guideline. That's not part of the rule book. The rule is that it was a knock on. And so they're put in this position, Bryn, which is quite tough, because you're yeah. given a guideline in one way to say this is how far you should but go the back, said, but on no. the other hand, it's the rule is he knocked it on. But the roof said it, it's not a knock on. Yeah. 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 So. Well, uh, right, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure Wayne Barnes said he didn't think there was a knock on. He said no knock on, no knock on, yes. twice. Correct. 
Um, and then obviously you go past the four phase count and then they end up scoring. But for, yeah, for me personally, it was it's tough to see as a New Zealand supporter, but the right decision was actually made. And if that was around the other way, well, like, man, like it should be going towards the All Black side. So for me, the consistency and getting the right call, especially in a big game like that, I actually don't really have a problem with it. It's great if the All Blacks are able to score with that. Um, and there was obviously the guidelines. If we keep it to two phases, then, you know, the All Blacks score because it went over that threshold. But for me personally, it was actually a good call. Like they actually got the right call. It's not good, not great for us, for us Kiwis, but, you know, it was the right call. And to come back to Jip's point as well, like, yeah, I just felt that this isn't this isn't as isn't an excuse to say that the South Africans won the game, but I thought the TMO was just it was always a, it was always in the game. You could always hear them. There was always the communication around that. And so I know the TMO can see everything, but you know, at the same time, the refs and the assistant refs for referees, they should they have the feel for the game. And the TMO should be maybe just asked when we need that kind of when you need that call, for example, that knock on or a head high that you know that that that, that, that the TMO is seeing. They shouldn't be coming in every so often and little plays that the, the feel of the game that the refs should have. And if it's a mistake, it's a mistake. But it's not a it's not a big one. It's just a small mistake that's kind of been made, if that makes sense. And it's not like Wayne Barnes is a junior ref. Like he's pretty experienced. Yeah. And then I was so I asked myself, is how often do I notice the TMO in the lead up? Hardly any. Like in any of those big test matches, you hardly heard from the TMO. Mm. It was controlled by the man in the middle and controlled really well. Yeah. And yes, there were some things missed and and you know, for both sides in the winning and losing of those games. But you didn't, they didn't factor. And it was like the big moment. I felt like we'd finally got a lot of people talking positively again about the game. It was, you know, a really exciting tournament. And I hope it just doesn't take the gloss off what I thought was a great Rugby World Cup. Mm. And, and yes, it probably wasn't the most entertaining final, but it was tense. Uh, it, was, it was tight. It was, it was close. It, was it created contest. a theatre. Yeah. Um, but I just think it would have been good if someone's voice didn't pop up every two seconds. OK, so relating to this, we have a question from Liam Tyrell, uh, an email out of New Zealand. When Wayne Barnes gave the penalty against Savia for not releasing, moments later, Barnes told Savia, you know, basically, basically all but acknowledged the wrong call. Um, mm. Pollard was able to carry on with the penalty kick. Why did Barnes not intervene and change his penalty call? Tries get reviewed and disallowed after whistle blows and before conversions are taken, even now afterwards. Why is it not the case with penalties? Uh, it's interesting that, that that's the case. Like, it doesn't seem consistent. <clears throat> yeah, but I suppose for me, <laughs> I've just gone on the about <laughs> saying less, less TMO action. Yeah. If I'm to jump yeah. on this and say that's overturned, then I'm going against my first argument. So yeah. I, I just think it should be up to... And there's the pressure yeah. and the responsibility to be consistent on the referee in the middle. Mm. It's, it's no different from players, Ross. You know, like, players make mistakes in games. We talked around the turnover rate with what the mistakes were from both teams. Refs are going to make mistakes. And you can live with it. And the fact that Wayne Barnes was able to acknowledge that to Artie, and I know it's not great because the three points are there, but if a ref can acknowledge that, you as a player right then and then can like, yep, sweet, right, I got the right call there. It's when there's that 50-50 and the ref doesn't come and acknowledge it, which, you know, probably a less experienced ref would do, but credit to Wayne Barnes, he went up to Artie and said, I got that one wrong. And as a player, you just walk on and move on. That's really it. Well, he's got the capability to reverse that call. Yeah, sure. Um, and and yeah, well, when I listen... When I listened back, he he didn't actually say sorry. He said sorry. I saw something different at the time, and so yeah, but, he but was sticking like, by his call. Yeah, but like there's there's so many instances where like the refs get it wrong. You know, yeah. there's going to be so many times. Well, I think he think knows he got that wrong. But if he saw it up on the yeah. screen, why didn't he do? I think because that's they, what the question is why didn't yeah, he do why something? didn't he do something about it? Um, so if that's the case, Bryn, my question to you is. Is it time for a captain's call? We saw it in Super Rugby for a little bit. Is it time in a big moment, f they have it in cricket, where you can go as a captain and say, look, this is the one call a game which I need to make. I want this reviewed yep. again. Here is my argument for why. Go and review it. I definitely think you can. Um, I remember when we, when we first did it in Super Rugby, Chip, I think you were playing as well during when it was there. Yeah, I was. Yeah, and... You were, and you know, I remember when we did talk about it, it was great, it was a great initiative because you know, as a captain, or you had your captain's challenge, and you, most of the time you probably got it right. I think the Chiefs man, Brad Weber, was unreal around his success rate getting that right. But what it did do, it actually slowed down the game as well. Mm. You know, you could have that form of momentum, and you're talking about the TMO not getting involved. It actually felt in some games because you were getting it right so often, four, five, six times, it actually slowed down the product, and the TMO would come in and it would be, you know, a two, three minute passage of seeing that clip. 
and then it, then it kind of slowed down the game. So I do think if there is a captain's challenge, the time for it to happen has to be really quick, has to be done and dusted around, you know, a minute. So it doesn't, you know, we're not we're not consumers like thinking like, this is too long, let's get on with the game. If we use that as an example, like Artie was the captain, he was involved, he would have been able to challenge that pretty quickly. Like he was adamant yeah. that it was a fair mm. yeah. turnover, which it was. Um, so yeah. I forgot, I actually forgot we did in Super Rugby until Brent just said that just then. <laughs> yeah. um, and it wasn't too successful, to be honest. Um, but I think, I think you'd get better, like even when it first came into the NRL, it was poorly used mm. and it was a bit of distraction, but now it's very, very, um, I suppose, tactical. And, and a point of difference between the good side and the bad is their ability to, to hold on to it and use it in the big moment. Well, and, and make sure, it's one, one unsuccessful call, if you know what I mean. So yeah. if you get it right, you can do it again yeah. and do it again and do it again. And that's, <clears throat> and I suppose, you do know when you're a player, like if, if you've, you know, and it, you, you've got to have the ability to go, yeah, I'm good on this one. There are some, <laughs> I've seen some players be pretty confident and then it's quite the opposite, but. What I do like about league as well is that it's a 10 seconds. You've only got 10 seconds to make your call. Yeah. You know, so it doesn't, you're not taking a very long time. So I think if, yeah, that's another solution. I think if we do go down that, that route, that it's 10 seconds right then and there, did you get it? Yes or no? And you go from there. One of the other ones, so we could go into Frizzell's yellow, we can go into Sam Kane's red, they are what they are. We've seen those happen on and off through our games. The challenge is not to put yourself in the position where that will happen. I think the hard really, one with it? Frizzell though, so I, I think yeah. that's come about more so since Darcy Swain's incident yes. with Quinn Tapia. But I just don't, like, if anything, the penalty was potentially the neck roll. Yeah, rather than the rather than the leg, yeah. rather than because like because he got the roll wrong. That's how he ended up mm. falling. Um, but I mean, he was he he did injure the player, so but, um, his weight was obviously significant enough. But I just don't think the intent was there. Yeah, and that's what the rule says. So rule nine twenty d: a player may lever the jackal out of a contest at the ruck, but must not drop their weight onto them or target the lower limb. He certainly didn't target didn't. the lower limb. He just did. His, he, Try to roll. The, he got the roll wrong, and that's yeah. how he ended up in that position. Here I am, just yeah. <laughs> sorry. But we're, but we're in a position again <laughs> where the results of it has dictated much of the penalty because if Bongi got up and carried on, yeah. there's no way that that's a yellow card. Yeah. It's just a play on, isn't it? No. Yeah. Um, but so I think it needed to be ref as it states, like with the intent. So penalty maybe. Yeah. Yellow card's a big call. Yeah. I yeah. think, and what we've seen with, and, and I think Sam articulated it really well. He goes, look, we've been here for two months. We've seen, if you go near the head, it is going to be red. Mm. Um, and that is the reality. Yeah. Um, mm. And you, we can argue, you know, should Khaleesi have got it? Yes, no, indifferent. There's enough grey or mitigating there to suggest that it could have gone either way, to be fair. Um, you know, especially if you use Curry's one earlier in the tournament mm. where you could hardly say it was his fault, but yeah. he still got regular. Well, then you got the Jesse Creel one. Like, he could have been sidelined for quite a while with the one he didn't get anything for yeah, yeah, at the start yeah. of the tournament. Yeah, yeah. But, so, but that's what I'm saying. Like, those inconsistencies week to week I can deal with. Yeah. Just when it's inconsistent and within the 80 minutes, that's what frustrates me. Yeah. That's what frustrated me about this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly, I, I think that's been one of the bones of contention, Bryn, about the difference between the cane red and the Khaleesi yellow. For me, I was actually happy with both calls. I felt, you know, you hear about the hinging at the hips, Khaleesi did it. That created the mitigation. Um, on the other hand, OK, he had a run-up, which probably gave him more chance to repair, and the Sam Kane had to react in the same way that Angus Tatavau had to react against Ireland. But to me, I was happy to accept both of those calls. Yeah, I thought the same thing. I thought as soon as I saw the replay of Sam's one and the things that we've talked around, um, you know, no no, no lower, no lowering over the body, was straight to the head. I was like, man, he's in trouble here. I think that's going to be upgraded to a red card. And then I think with Sia, his technique was actually pretty good. Even though he was coming in at a lot more, more force, his body positioning and actually where he hit first, it wasn't straight in the head. It kind of went on the shoulder, then up towards the head. Um, so yeah, I was actually, I was gutted obviously as an All Black um, supporter to see Sammy go off as a, a red card. But yeah, I, I thought both calls were actually the right call in the end. But before we move on, I'm interested in your take on the final scrum because there was a hit <coughs> New Zealand had dominance, and Faf didn't put the ball in. I know you must have done this at some point. Oh, 100% so talk, talk us through it. what happened there, because 
there could have been a, uh, a free kick there. It was unbelievable, like great game management. There's a halfback. I remember Jason Ryan used to always tell me, he said, you know, if whether and understanding in that situation, for me, if I was in that situation, with, with everybody watching and how the game was going, with that amount of time, I know I've probably got one chance here that he's not going to blow this a penalty. That's what I would that's what I would be thinking in the game. He wants the players to dictate the outcome. And so when putting that ball in, and I saw no, you know, knowing as a halfback in that situation, you know that all blacks are going to try and get absolutely everything. And you want to be able to have the ball stay with. So Jason Roy would always say, like, don't put the ball in unless it's stay with. If it's going backwards, just do not put the ball in. And then to Fuss credit, you know, a lot of guys that aren't experienced and it's twitchy, you've got our nines right beside you. Get the ball in, get the ball oh, in. World Cup on the line. In, put the ball in. World Cup on the line. For him to be able to step away and not put that ball in, that there, that right there was the end of the World Cup. And so game management wise and understanding Fuff as a half big, I yeah, as a half big, I smiled and look, yeah, he's done, he's done really, really well there. Because what it did it was one set and then they were able to kick the ball out after that. Well, in saying that, they went into the touchline, but yeah, it was right done and dusted there. So very cool and calm from a very experienced veteran campaigner like our Fuff was great to see as a halfback, as a halfback purist. <laughs> I, I thought as a front rower, I was like, <laughs> this is the perfect scrum for Nepo La La La. Yeah. This is exactly why he's been picked. I was like, this is, this is great coaching. They've got this guy and he absolutely hoovered them and didn't get rewarded. Yeah. So I was sitting there going, where's the reward? Okay, so let's carry on the two themes of reviews and that scrum with a question that we've got from Carl Martin, an email out of England. You can email us too. We've got one more show next week, so please send us an email. Um, Aotearoa Rugby Pod at sky.co.nz or jump into the comment section and send us something there. What is the point of a scrum? Feeds aren't straight. The refs can't ref big scrums at important moments. The only reason for a scrum seems to be to win a penalty from it for either side. As much as I dislike the slow TMO, why can't a captain have a TMO review of such an important scrum decision, whether it's one a half or whatever? It is an interesting point because there are different mindsets when it comes to the scrum. There's the get it in and get it out mindset, and there's the, we're scrumming here for dominance and penalties and yellow cards and points. Um, what do you think about it being applied specifically to scrums that can be such a lottery? No, I think it should be just under the captain's challenge yeah. rather than making it specific. Um, and then you just got to trust your front rowers. Um, and if you're smart enough, you wait for the big moment. You don't try and use it mm. in a 50-50. Like that would have been the time you'd use it, go... <laughs> Delaying, putting the ball in, review it, delayed. Mm. Probably would have been a free kick, not a penalty, though. Yeah. Which would have probably led to another scrum. But at least <laughs> it was the All Blacks ball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've heard some nonsense in the last few weeks about people wanting to get rid of scrums. Oh. Like, it's one of the best parts of a game. It's so dramatic. Like, the way that Faf did his thing and the way the All Blacks did their thing, it's just, it's actually great theatre. But it also allows a different type of athlete to play our game. Yeah. You know, like, if... If you get rid of it or you start tinkering with it, then you are going to change the whole dynamic of the athlete that's playing in those positions. Mm. But while we're at it, Bryn, we've got some really good suggestions this week. Bill Brown is out of Auckland. Um, he's really worried about the, the medical timeouts. We saw a lot of those towards the end of the game. He's really worried about the, the water, um, people coming on and passing on um, messages. Warren Gatlin had a big spray at the Springboks about that, didn't he? So he's worried about those things. Um, and he says, I have a solution to reduce the swarm of water carriers and medics in Test Rugby these days. If it was made compulsory for them to all be fitted with microphones that fed to the broadcaster director to use at their choice, then we might find that players won't be as thirsty as they previously were. What do you make of that, Bryn? Good television, man, because there's a lot, there's a lot of the water, water people do to try to get you to, to go down to get a tactical kind of uh, tactical break. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a funny idea. But I think for me, it's like it just needs to be policed in, in a different way because I think, you know, whenever we used to play the South African teams back in the day, you would know that, you know, they wanted to be explosive for short periods of time. So, you know, they'll, they'll put a, a prop down, a lockdown or a hooker down to be able to try to slow down the game or, you know, a water carrier is coming on straight away and they're telling them to, to go down. There's a, there's a secret code word that you have as a team and you could hear it from the South Africans. Whenever we used to play them, they'd go down. And so I think it's on the, the referees to be able to say, no, get off. And if it happens, you know, I don't know, maybe two or three times, it goes to a penalty straight away. Because that, I think, you know, the back end of games we found whenever I used to play the South African teams, especially the 50, 55, 60-minute mark to the 80th-minute mark, and especially if they're in front or it's really close, 
they slow down the momentum of the game, and which is a great ploy. It's within the rules, and that you know it's a it's a solution that they have. But I think if it gets to a point like that where the medics are coming on twice, maybe yeah, I think I think twice is enough to give the warning, and then it ends up just becoming a penalty right then and there. And then it, you know, I know as a player, and if you're a doctor or a medic or a physio or a, or a coach, you're like get off the field, like we don't want a penalty. Yeah, my frustration from the weekend was more. Barnes saying, well, the clock's off, so no, there's no problem here. But it's actually, no, it's stemming our flow and momentum. So there is a problem. It's not about just turning the clock off. It's about let's keep the game going. And I think it's one area that I think Beno keeps the best at. Honestly, the way he keeps play going, he doesn't allow any team to slow down. He will challenge water carriers to get off. Um, and it's just probably not an area of Wayne Barnes' focus. But mm. I think the work that... Um, was done in Super Rugby, made, it really made it evident to me that Ben O'Keefe is one of the best refs in the world of keeping this game going and policing 30 seconds at the line out, 30 seconds at a scrum, you know, like he really does focus his attention on that and it's a, it's a real good strength of his in the way he lets games flow. Mm. I find it interesting there's this, this balance between refs getting calls right and the, and the best for the game. You know, I, I think of Bill Harrigan within the NRL, you know, famously let things go, but also famously Bill Harrigan games were amazing to watch, you know, so how officious should you be in comparison to what makes this game attractive and makes a person who's 50-50 on whether they're going to watch some rugby who only tunes into the World Cup final go, I watched that World Cup final, I'm going to watch the opening round of Super Rugby next year. Mm. Well, I think what league does is there is definitely a, a more of a focus to put the whistle away in the big game. State of origin, grand final matches, they let it be dictated by the players out there. But it's a lot simpler. So it's hard to mm -hmm. compare. Yeah. Um, and that's why I always like, I like the idea of what happened in Super Rugby that the ref had to go to the TMO. I just think that just makes sense. I'll come to you when I need you. I don't need you in my ear. Like, We've got three sets of eyes out here. If we miss something, we miss something. And yep. I didn't notice the TMO prior to the World Cup. Yep. So it was going fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just think the do big still, occasion got the better of some people. Do you still think that with that mindset, if there's something that's quite um, malicious and an intent to be able to injure someone, like a red card or an elbow to the But in Super Rugby, in Super and, Rugby, in Super Rugby, if there's anything like that, you're allowed to enter if it's missed. Ah, okay. So... The, the whole directive was like, if there's any thuggery, absolutely, call it out. But outside of that, you need to be called into the piece. And I thought it worked well. And actually, the whole bunker system and all that was modified off that process, but probably a little bit more elaborate in terms of, I suppose, access to cameras and so forth. But um, it was off the back of that trial at Super Rugby. Mm. It's hard. We've got a complex game. Yeah. We've got a complex <coughs> game. It is what it is. It's never going to be perfect. And I think rugby until the end of time, the losing team's fans will always be saying, well, there's something wrong that needs to be fixed here. But and that's just the nature of rugby. That's, and, and I don't know whether that's sour grapes. That's just the nature of a complex game with a million rules and a million ways you could rule. I'll say it again, though. I, I don't expect it consistent week to week. I expect mm. it consistent within that 80 minutes. Yeah. That's, that was my only gripe. I, yeah. I, it doesn't bother me if we'd lost and it was, you know, consistent, but it just was inconsistent. Yeah, and, and even I got text messages out of South Africa, Bryn, and they were saying, look, our people, our pundits are saying this is wrong after the first half. You know, this is not the way it should be. You know, let the game play. Well, yeah, that's it. That's it. We want a free-flowing game of rugby, don't we? And, you know, that comes a lot. Well, not, not with just players and the way the tactical, tactical way of how you play, but how it's officiated as well. But in saying that, Players do know that whether it's an official or the type of game that's been played, the preparation side that you do put in, you have an understanding of how this game's going to go. And you've got you're always in a solution focus. You know, if you don't, if you're not getting the calls right, what's your solution? What's the next, what's the next thing you need to concentrate on? So I can imagine, you know, they would have a lot of what of scenarios around not getting the right call, playing with a playing with a red card. So you are prepared in that sense to try and get it right. But I think as a as a as a consumer watching the game, the more free flowing and the solutions that Jip's talking around with Ben O'Keefe, the way he officiates things and the um, the captain's challenge and that kind of stuff, it will help our game. But I think you are right, Ross. We just have a complex game. There's so many rules. There's so many little situational things that happen in one you know instance at a ruck. 
there's like a lot of decisions that the ref have to have to try and get right. So um, it's oh. a complex game, and you look at it, very very simple to be able to follow as a as a as a as a pundit. And I think we do. We should just embrace that it is complex because I do think it's a skill set. And I've said it before for captains and certain senior players in the game is there who can react to the ref the fastest. And there is an element to this that you know we we didn't quite, but. Where I'm saying the inconsistency is like, I don't know how the TMO can enter for all these things, but then Mr. Groot's like nose getting flattened. Yeah. And then saying, oh, I it just, it, yeah, just brushed it. Mm. So like, and I know South African fans will be like, oh, he's just complaining. I'm not, like, I, I accept that we lost. We, we still put ourselves in the position to win that game. We didn't take it. South Africa won it. And this one incident I'm talking about isn't the defining. Yeah. It's just to, I suppose, give an example of what, what I'm trying to say in terms of the inconsistency of the TMO, not Wayne Barnes. Mm. When we ended this episode, we kind of talked about, you know, sour grapes not looking like <laughs> got sour grapes. And I think we really want to push the fact that there's one thing, the Springboks did what they needed to do to win the World Cup. Good on them. They, they did it right. They did it right again. Great coaching, great players, executed what they needed to execute, and they did it, and that's why they're world champions. So congratulations to them in South Africa. On the other hand, there are issues that need to be sorted within our game, and I think we can treat them as separate conversations, maturely, yeah. oh, absolutely. And, and without it being sour grapes, hey, what about this conversation here? You know, mm. like it doesn't have to be that, you know. No, it doesn't, it, but I can see, like, I, I'm a fan too, like, if I'm watching this show from a South African mm. perspective, like, we have to talk about it, yeah. <laughs> otherwise yeah, yeah, totally. there's no show. Yeah. But we do acknowledge that South Africa deserve to win, and they are the world champions, but they're, there's a lot of frustration at the back of this game. Not, mm. I, I think from not the committed fan. Yeah. Which is my concern. Is I, what I loved about this World Cup is bringing the appeal back to our game. Yeah. We had positive, you know, stories being written. We had positive, you know, around the country there was just this vibe. You know, it did help that we had that awesome game against Ireland. But I don't know, just it wasn't so negative. Mm. And then the biggest moment, I was like, oh, you know, this is this is everyone. The, you just sort of bringing the life back into rugby. And then <laughs> all I've heard about is TMOs. Since. <laughs> it's like everyone I've spoken to is yeah. like, oh, a TMO. And even South Africans. Like, I've got a lot of South African friends. And, and they're like, you know, like, we'll take a win yeah. um, and, and be happy about it. But it was a very frustrating game to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, why don't we move on to doing some celebrating? The Rugby <laughs> Awards this morning were on. Firstly, Adi Savia, finally, as we mentioned, won. World Player of the Year. We've wondered why it's taken this long. Obviously, there are other great players around, but he has certainly deserved it over a long period of time. Bryn, what is it that Artie does outside of the highlight reel stuff that everyone can see that makes him the best player in the world right now? Yeah, first and foremost, to have, a, have an award like that um, and be in conversations for multiple years, it's his consistency of the way that he plays. And look, he's not the biggest guy in the world. Like, you know, as a loose forward, he's not the biggest guy, but pound for pound, man, in contact area, when he's when he's carrying the ball, one of his biggest strengths is he doesn't he never dies with the ball. He's always pretty much you know and within that gain line, and it takes two to three guys to try and stop him. So that effort area around his ball carriers have been able to get the advantage line is massive in this day and age, especially with the forwards. His his loose forward carries around his core rolls around the jackal work and being able to get crucial turnovers. Uh, in a lot of test matches early in the year, there were times that he was having crucial turnovers of like you know stopping tries or stunting momentum. In that way, and then I think he's he's grown, I think game management wise as lead as a leader within their All Black squad as well. You've seen his growth in his decision makings around big moments in games. You look at his leadership in and around going off Sam Kane um, for that final, right, asking the right questions, trying to um, get the best result for his team. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's just well deserved and the consistency as well to be able to. We think that you know he should be a two time winner considering how well he was last year. So yeah, for me, it's consistency of doing all, the, all those things that I've touched on. And um, and he's not the biggest man in the world, but, man, he's got the biggest heart in the world for sure. His impact's on games. Like, that charge down for me is exactly why mm. he is World Player of the Year. It's not the highlight reel stuff. It's his work off the ball. Um, you know, just he sometimes looks down and out, like the 70th minute, and the ball will come his way and he springs into life. You, mm. Like, his engine is so big. He's so fit. Um, and, and I just think um, it is good reward for consistent performance, but he, he is just... If sometimes it's easy, you know, when you're fresh and start a game to make those big carries and and you know, but he has an impact on the game in the first few minutes and the last. Like he never he never comes out of a game. He never fades away. He just seems to always get better and better. And when the big moment comes, he wants the ball. Yeah. 
or he mm. wants to be the man that makes the tackle, or he wants to, he wants to take the calculated risk to get the breakdown turnover. Mm. He wants to be the guy, and that is what's made him World's Player of the Year, personally. Yeah. Um, as the president of the Mark Salier fan club, you're obviously pretty happy about him getting breakthrough player of the year. But the one I really want to talk about is Andy Farrell, Bryn. So he gets coach of the year. His team went on a big winning streak, but when push came to shove in the quarterfinals, they dipped out. It's hard to fathom, and I know that Jack Nienaba is only head coach of the Springboks. There's a Rossi appears to be pulling the strings. You can see it in the coach's box. But it's hard to imagine why the Springboks, considering they've gone back to back and they didn't, in a hard way, don't have the coach of the year. That's probably a good way to put it. I think, you know, no different from a player. I think, you know, as a coach, you, you know, you're defined of winning a Rugby World Cup. And, you know, so winning a Rugby World Cup, you'd have to think that's who the best coach of the year goes to. But I can have, also have an understanding of the art the art of Ireland, sorry, and what Farrell's done, not just at the World Cup, you know, obviously would have loved to go on a bit further, but you, you think around the whole year, he was able to win, to not to not lose a game. You know, so he's obviously lost one game within the year and it's probably gone into the reason why he's gone into being coach of the year. But for me personally, if you won a Rugby World Cup, Fozzie would have been the, you know, the, the coach of the year, I thought, because... You know, as players, you, you, you're shown you kind of metal of winning a rugby world cup. So, yeah, I think he's pretty hard done by. And um, but Aaron, Andy Farrow at the same time, good coach, but yeah, probably would have gone in a different direction. I always struggle with this one because I actually have an argument with myself because I have, I have sometimes I think, well, we're talking about Artie being the consistent player, and you know, like he didn't, he wasn't part of the Springboks that won. So, are we saying that the World Player of the Year should be? Peter Steff because he mm. stood up in the, yeah, the, the, big, major the major moment. So, like, if you look at it with the same theory with coaching, yeah. Andy Farrell has been the most consistent. Yes. You know? You could make a strong argument that the way that he didn't rotate his players led directly led to the fact that they copped out in the quarterfinals, and that in itself could be a big strike. I think it would be too easy to say that's why they dropped out. Like, I, I do think a lot of credit has to go to the All Blacks and the way what they brought to that game as well. Like, I, it's kind of hard, but yeah, I, I see what you mean. Um, because the teams that probably rotated their squads the most um, made it to the final, albeit, you know, South Africa had a much more challenging road, so yes. looked a little bit more weathered than maybe the All Blacks did, and the style of game they played, but... And, and to me, that's part of the reason why Nienaba, even though you could controversially say he's not the head coach, mm. probably deserved it because of... I know, this is why I argue it. both ways yeah. myself. Like, I don't know which way to go, but... Um, I, it's the same... God, I, I've got to stop bringing up the NRL, but... <laughs> um, you know, Andrew Webster wins Coach of the Year, but well, I, I don't know what more Ivan... <laughs> can do yeah. with the Panthers, you know. Yeah. For context, uh, the Panthers won three premierships in a row and he's, I think he only got coach of the year once. Anyway, mm. I, I don't know if there is an answer. The Women's Sevens Player of the Year was Tyler Nathan Wong. And obviously she played tremendously well. And for people who don't know outside of New Zealand, Tyler now plays rugby league. And this is a real indication now, Bryn, of some of the issues that the women's game is having <coughs> around New Zealand, where we're losing world-class premier talent to the NRL, to the NRLW, and to the point where the current World Player of the Year doesn't even play our game. Well, I think you'll find she was potentially released to go do that yeah. with the idea of coming back into the sevens yeah. at the Olympics. So. Right. I did, and she played the full season Yes, as well as a sevens player and then was released out after the sevens season. I suppose I'm not, I'm not saying that she doesn't deserve it because she absolutely does. No, no, but it's just an interesting she does play our game. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, she is coming not back. not right now. Not right now. Yeah. But, like, my understanding is she will be playing sevens. Right. I definitely hope to see her back in a, in a Black Fan sevens jersey because she'll be a key part in us, uh, I suppose, going and getting gold again. Yeah, absolutely. OK, let's move on to the WXV. Right, so on the weekend, Australia upset France. Wow. Yeah, wow. 29-20, <laughs> no-one saw it coming, and it's thrown the WXV wide open. This three-week tournament, not everyone plays everyone, and it's turned into the fact that, once again, it's going to be New Zealand versus England, most likely, in order to, to win this. Um, England's on 10 points, New Zealand's on 6 points. The winner of this game is going to be the winner of the tournament with some points differential stuff 
mm. in there and if, if England were able to get a bonus point they could still take it out a few bits and bobs but it's come down to them so my question Jip is from what you saw of New Zealand v France of course France then the next week looked pretty average do you think they've got the capacity to beat an England team that are doing what they do in the, in the set piece and with their kicking and getting it done? That's where they'll need to nail them is around the set piece more um, because that's their biggest weapon. Um, that's, you know, and also probably the discipline not allowing them those easy entries. Uh, I thought we looked a hell of a lot slicker on the weekend against Wales. I think you know, there was some amazing work um, in the back line of, of bodies in motion. I thought Paul was great um, in terms of her roving role. She got a nice little inside ball for a try. Um, obviously, Tui scored four tries, she scored three, so they found width on the edge, but they also found uh, an ability to sort of break through the middle of, of a fairly tight defence of Wales. So I, I, I'm confident enough that this will, this will go close. Um, can they win without letting them get a bonus point? That, that'll be hard. Like, I think it, it's, it's going to be very close, but can they get a bonus point of their own to, to take it out? Well, it. They can definitely score points. Yep. Both sides can, to be honest. Yep. Differently, but yep. they can. Then it comes down to who beat who. And yeah. so it goes down to the winner yeah. of the game in the end, yeah. um, if, if they're all tied so up. So the key, it's the bonus point factor. Yeah. Well, obviously you've got to win first, but I think they can win. And then it's just how those bonus points finish that's going to be the niggly part. Yeah, yeah. So definitely one to keep an eye on to see who comes out on top. Repeat of last year's Women's Rugby World Cup final. So interesting to see what happens there. Before we go, we've got one more episode next week. Don't forget, we're back to have a look at the season and review the WXV final as well as everything that's gone on and maybe a sneak peek towards next year and what we're expecting there. Before we go, favourite moment or try of the World Cup? Oh, jeez, question without notice. Um, oh, this is right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, I'll, be, I'll be smart. No, no I, I think... Um, Probably the Irish game, um, Will Jordan's try when, like just a big moment for me personally. I just that that was the turning of that game and the winning, in, in, in my opinion. So Will Jordan. Will Jordan. Yeah, and you have to probably pick yeah. where we scored the most tries. So. That's right. And he made the Dream Team of the Year at the World Rugby Awards, which is he would have to great for him. Yeah. Um, him and Damien Pinot on the wings. Uh, Brennett, what about you? Oh, literally just took mine. <laughs> he took mine. <laughs> You're allowed to say one. You can't go past that, that that kind of try. I think it was it was Cullen esque, wasn't it? I think the speed that that Will shows and the chip and chase to be able to get that guy in terms of the context as well. I think, um, yeah, he had an outstanding tournament. You know, probably should have had nine tries if Richie passed him the ball. So, I'm hoping that Richie's buying him a few <laughs> beers at the moment. <laughs> Um, you know, it's a shout out for that one because yeah, he should have should have nine. <laughs> should have had the men's record. <laughs> should have had the men's record. Yeah, That's totally. Sure. And for me, I think it had to be Sia Khaleesi. Not not necessarily the lifting of the trophy, but the way that he talks afterwards, the heart and the soul and his connection to his people. Like the, <clears throat> the guy runs deep. You know, that connection runs deep. Yeah, and it's I think hard to deny. You have to give credit to Rusty in that sense yeah. as well. Like he he's obviously had an ability to connect with that group on playing for something bigger than themselves. Like, their purpose is incredibly yeah. um, inspiring. Not to say that other teams around the world don't, but it is, it's real and yeah. it's raw, and it's the first thing that comes to his mind when he has that victory is, is what it can do for his country and, and what, it, what pathway it can sort of show to everyone across South Africa, which, you know, you get tingles just sort of talking about it, of the impact and the power and that's, you know, if there's a team to win, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's great when South Africa do because it, it is so empowering to their people. Very well done to the entire team and we look forward to seeing, I suppose, how that team evolves going forward into the next four years and whether they can have a crack at becoming the first team to do three in a row. No. <laughs> Watch out. Just let me get over this one. <laughs> <laughs> or Scott Robertson's here. Yeah. No, this could all change quite dramatically. All the same. Thank you very much once again, Jibber. Thank you. <laughs> Bryn, thank you very much, mate. You deserve a decent sleep tonight by the looks of it. Oh, mate, I'm looking forward to it. We've got a day off, so boys have worked, boys have worked really, really hard. So, yeah, we've got a day off. So, yeah, I'll be at the onsen.
pretty much the whole the whole time. So it'll yeah. be good. Of course you will. Loves a sparkle. <laughs> Loves a sparkle. <laughs> um, thank you as well for joining us once again on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Please send us an email, Aotearoa Rugby Pod at sky.co.nz. Jump into the comment section. We'll do what we can to answer your questions next week. I think we'll delve pretty deep into a lot of the questions that we haven't got around to just yet, including one question that we got this week about where Johnny Sexton ranks in the all-time first fives after his career. Um, so thank you very much for that question. Munya, we'll, we'll get on to that. So thank you very much for tuning in once again. We'll catch you next week. Matewa. <laughs>